Roz Peterson. I am the, you got it, that it's recording. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm Roz Peterson. I'm the public policy director for NAP, and I'm happy that you're able to join us for our update on the legislative session so far. They've been working fast and furious since they started a meeting in January. And now everything's sort of coming to a close with large omnibus bills and the budgets are getting defined and uh, we're learning more and more of what's in the bills, but as usual, what's in the house bill that passes there might be different than the Senate bill. In fact, it is different than the Senate bill. And also the governor has different priorities as well. But before we dive into that, um, I'm gonna have Steph give us a quick update on what's happening with NAOP and some of the activities coming up so we, it doesn't get lost in the end. So Steph, if you wanna take it away and give us an update on what's happening. Yeah, so uh, next week we have a breakfast program. It'll be at Golden Valley Country Club like usual. It's on Wednesday the 10th. Um, it's called Anatomy of a Capital Markets Deal. So Tom O'Brien will be moderating and they're gonna be talking about um, a couple of different capital markets deals. Um, in industrial, multifamily, and uh, office, 10 West End. We'll be talking about that one. So um, if you haven't already signed up, we'd love to see you there. We'll have, right now we have close to 100 people, so we should have more, you know, 120, 130 by next week. So uh, you can join us for that one. Uh, we sent out an email yesterday. You've probably seen emails before that as well, but it's uh, right on the homepage if you want to get signed up. And then uh, is it too soon to talk about June 6th? I know it's still uh, being planned, but maybe something to save the date. Sure, uh, we are public policy team is planning, you know, the year end event we've done a couple times. Uh, we're looking at June 6th, so it's a Tuesday next month. Um, we're still finalizing the venue. So when we have those details ready, um, it'll be an afternoon event. Uh, we will send that out to everyone. So it'll just be a free event social in the afternoon, probably like four to six. But uh, once we have the uh, location determined, we'll get that info out. Thank you so much. Well, from here, we will probably, I'll send it off to our, our colleagues that are having fun, spending wee hours in the night at the Capitol, getting you know close and personal with everyone and finding out you know how well they hold up at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, so we have Tom Freeman and Donovan Hurd with Pay Free Drinker, and they're going to give us a quick overview and then dive into a little bit more of the details of what where the legislature is at and what we can look forward to. Take it away, guys. I think, thanks, Roz. Um, and I see our, our colleague Dave Johnson's on as well, so he, he can uh, chime oh, in good. with uh, infinite wisdom where uh, maybe I'm uh, misguided or uh, uh, too blunt. Uh, I think you did a great job. We are we are certainly uh, coming down to the wire here. Uh, this is a typical program for us in May. Uh, the the legislature is set to adjourn in uh, in a couple weeks here on the 22nd. Uh, and um, you know, with unified control, I think you all have heard me say, uh, you know, the, before the legislature can move as fast or as slow as they want. Uh, I think. Uh, this year, it's probably uh, different variations of moving fast. Uh, so either uh, ludicrous speed or hyperspeed or whatever uh, movie reference you want to make here. Um, and so we are coming down to the budget. And so I'm going to share my screen. We, uh, we put together some slides um, and uh, we'll go through it. But I, I just recommend people to, um, if it goes into uh, displaying the slideshow mode, Roz, can you give me a thumbs up if this is working? Uh, but please just just stop us and Dave and Donovan, uh, you know, I uh, just jump in and, and add in any flavor. I think, you know, the, the goal of this is really to focus on a few different things, primarily to focus on the tax bill, uh, but also focus on transportation, other investments that, that the legislature is making. And then some, uh, we kind of included ancillary issues that either impact NIAP or businesses, uh, so tenants as well. Uh, and then in addition to that, um, you know, all the bills that the, we'll, we'll list them at the end of all the things that they've already uh, passed into law. And you may have read about, uh, you know, either on online or, or in the newspaper uh, or heard about on, on, uh, on the news. So 
um, a, a full briefing. <clears throat> um, I do expect, I will just say, I think uh, in years past, we, we kind of play a betting game of when special session will start. Uh, I don't think that will happen at all, uh, which is great, I guess, for Dave Donovan and I's uh, personal life. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, I will say, I think that the legislature has a goal to get done early. Uh, we will read about that, uh, whether or not they get done six hours early or uh, two days early is probably up for debate, um, but no matter what, they'll probably claim uh, some historic victory of getting done uh, before they had to get done, uh, which, you know, I, I'll refrain from commenting on. Um, so just quickly to go, well, we've kind of gone on through this in the past, but um, going through the budget overview, remember we have, you know, we have a surplus of 17 and a half billion uh, five and a half of which is ongoing or structural. Uh, and, and so that's important to remember. That's kind of setting the table. Um, the state budget, they, they passed a law early in session prior to the February forecast that this includes uh, inflation for the spending side. Uh, and then this budget cycle is to set the budget for uh, fiscal year 24, 25 and uh, the out years of 26, 27. Um, We'll say that uh, to give the legislature some credit, uh, they uh, they set budget targets earlier than uh, I've ever seen. Uh, obviously, with one party control, that's a lot easier of a task, but uh, they are very different bodies. And so what this really means is they've set the parameters for the budget as a whole uh, very, very early in, in, on March 21st. Um, I have, uh, been up here for 13 sessions. I haven't seen that happen, uh, in the month of March, I don't believe, uh, let alone, uh, March 21st. Um, and, uh, in that budget, you know, they're anticipating, I know Sean likes, uh, us to focus on the spending side as well. You know, the budget's going to go from 52 billion, uh, to about 70 billion uh, in that budget. So a pretty rapid increase uh, in state spending and state obligations uh, that they are tying our state to uh, in, in terms of uh, what the state's budget looks like. Um, at the top here on these slides, uh, these are the kind of uh, highlighting the, the budget targets. Uh, and so from the tax standpoint, it was a $3 billion target uh, and uh, 1.3 billion of that is ongoing tax cuts. Um, so uh, remember that aids and credits and things of that nature are included in the tax bill. So that's where that one-time money uh, will will be allocated. We'll get into that. And I I put in parentheses because it was on the spreadsheet. I thought it was very. Um, I, I chuckled when I read it, but uh, they had to include a the parentheses of net. Uh, 1.3 because as you'll see they are raising revenue uh, even in a time with such historic surpluses um, and not just raising some revenue they're raising a significant amount of revenue uh, in a mul in multiple uh, areas so uh, you know we've talked about the governor's bill in the past so I did not include anything uh, necessarily in, in description here we'll get into it in a slide uh, next but um, it just focusing on the House bill, they are creating a new fifth, fifth tier income tax bracket of 10.85% uh, for income uh, above 1 million for married uh, filing joint and uh, 600,000 for single filers. Um, obviously that includes pass-through entities. So that is uh, something that we have great objection to. Uh, you know, it raises about 530, million in the first uh, part of the budget and 500 of ongoing money. Um, you know, this is uh, something that frankly is um, you know, really problematic in, in terms of the overall budget, but is certainly something that the Democrats in charge of the House feel is an appropriate um, step. They, they are reducing taxes at the lower, lower levels of those income brackets. And I think they're, the way they have phrased it in committee uh, is really that during the pandemic, the uh, gap between uh, low and middle income and the wealthy has has increased, and they feel this is an appropriate response uh, to that situation. Um, it's being opposed by uh, you know all the various business groups and and the like, uh, so you know, no, no real interest there, or diff, you know um, nothing interesting or or unique to point out there. 
Uh, in the bill, they also have federal conformity uh, on excess business losses. Uh, that raises about $90 million. Uh, that was not discussed. In the, uh, it was discussed in the um, earlier federal conformity bill, but was not agreed to uh, to be taken up right away uh, for a variety of different reasons. Um, they have a modified Social Security exemption. Uh, we'll probably talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, I know that on the campaign trail, we heard a lot about how we should be exempting all Social Security state taxes. Um, they do not do that. Um, they do not come close to doing that. Uh, they also have uh, small walls checks, as I'm unfortunately referring to them as, <laughs> um, and uh, direct aid payments. Um, the good news is they do not uh, have any increase to the state general levy, so they are not uh, raising taxes directly on on our properties uh, as we've seen in the past. This is um, uh, quite surprising, I think, uh, just based on the attention it has gotten. But I think it's a recognition of what's going on in the marketplace and understanding, uh, you know, how difficult the office market is uh, by some in in the Democratic caucus. Uh, also, unfortunately, they they did not include the historic rehabilitation credit. Um, you know, after years of of wanting that to be included in the House bill, some of that might be posturing, knowing that the Senate was going to include it and trying to get it into conference committee. Um, and then, lastly, I'll just point out: overall, the bill raises about a billion dollars of ongoing money. Um, that's uh, that's not nothing. Uh, obviously, uh, that's why the spending side is continuing to grow. Um, they're they're seeing the tales of what their spending priorities are, and so they feel they need to raise that amount of money. Um, so switching over to the Senate, uh, they increase the Social Security exemption. Uh, about 80% of people would be exempt, uh, not fully exempting that, which is a, a major controversy for a 34-33 split, where four uh, first-term members had made it a key priority and signed letters early in session that they wouldn't agree to a tax bill if it didn't do that. Um, that quickly changed, clearly, uh, and uh, they passed that bill off the floor and all of those members voted for it. Um, there's no changes to the state general levy. Uh, it does restore the historic rehabilitation tax credit uh, retroactive to July 1st, um, and, uh, and so that's a really good sign and a key priority uh, for the Senate that they are planning to, to try and push hard for this year. Um, Probably the weirdest thing that has happened all session for me, I don't know if, uh, I suppose that's a high bar, um, and I don't know if Donovan or Dave would agree, but um, this is also in the in the House bill. Uh, there's a there's a bill that uh, it, it never had an author mm -hmm. in the Senate. It never had, obviously, uh, so there was no bill, there was no hearing. Uh, it was such a good idea that no senator uh, put their name on it. Uh, and it's being referred to as the worldwide reporting uh, provision, uh, just appeared in the omnibus tax bill uh, amendment uh, with no uh, public you know, awareness. Uh, this raises $452 million on uh, mostly on corporations or businesses that not only are headquartered here, but anybody who is doing business here. So a foreign, foreign company that has a sales factor in Minnesota uh, would have to, um, all those entities would have to look at all of their worldwide reporting, uh, their worldwide sales, uh, to determine their, their sales uh, uh, tax here. And, and that is something that uh, has really caused a stir. Uh, I know the governor and the tax chairs have received calls from foreign embassies, foreign corporations, um, foreign governments uh, in, in and uh, CEOs of major Fortune uh, 100, 500 companies here, uh, we would be the only, not, not the only state in the country to do this, we'd be the only place in the world to have a system like this. Um, some states have an election, so the company can elect it to, um, <clears throat> to, to do their reporting this way. Obviously, then it would be a benefit to them to, to do that. Um, they don't want to have an election because uh, the goal here is to raise revenue. Um, it's being met with significant opposition. There's already been meetings with the governor's office and commissioners and things like that uh, to try and pull that from the bill. 
Um, but at the end of the day, I know many have heard me say this before, sometimes this is a math problem uh, and it's not a policy problem, which is really difficult uh, to deal with. Um, and so something we're watching very closely for a variety of clients and, and anticipate it's gonna be uh, quite contentious down, uh, down the wire here. Um, the, the the most uh, or I guess the the part of the bill that impacts us the most is uh, they increase the homestead exclusion, uh, which does not include an offset to the CI property taxes. So this happens at the local level. Um, the homestead uh, value goes up, and uh, all other uh, taxpayers would have a small increase for CI property. That would be about a twenty five million dollar shift at the local level spread across the country or across the state, excuse me. Um, and so certainly something we have opposed uh, in the past uh, without a, a reduction in the state general levy to offset that um, and something we're working on to try and uh, you know get an offset included in the bill. Uh, Senator Rest actually agreed with Senator Weber uh, in committee about that. Um, we're hopeful we can try to push her for that, but certainly not a great position heading into conference committee. Um, and then lastly, they, they do have small uh, walls checks, if you will, or, or direct payments for some Minnesotans, uh, much like the House. So um, I'll just stop there, see if there's any questions, or Dave or Donovan, if I missed anything. Um, you know, I know that's a lot to digest and pretty in the weeds. I think the only thing I would add uh, on this uh, worldwide reporting as we started getting calls from our tax experts going, where did that come from? Uh, this idea had been discredited 15 years ago and even California <laughs> rejected it. So just to reinforce what Tom was saying on, on the insanity of, of that particular provision. So. Yeah, I've never heard uh, an argument <laughs> made in committee of California did this and repealed it. Uh, within a year, so clearly yeah. it's not a great idea. Um, right. that, that, so, other questions from the group? Hey Tom, did you um, did you mention it on the small walls checks? Are they basically the same exact parameters on the House and Senate bill, like as far as income level and the amount of the check? Um, I think they are. Donovan, do you know the de do you have the details, or or can you do you want to comment on that? Yeah, they both have a have a cutoff as like, I believe it's one hundred and fifty thousand for married, and it's seventy eight for individuals or seventy six for individuals. I apologize, it's right there. And then uh, for married filers, it's basically five fifty in both bodies, and uh, individuals two seventy five. Uh, there's minor differences. The Senate's like five fifty eight and seven or two seventy eight or something, but they're pretty small uh, in regards to what the walls checks were proposed originally. And I don't know, just as a quick reminder, when he re-upped his walls checks last year, it was $4 billion of one-time money for 2,000 for married, 1,000 for individuals. So you can see it shrunk uh, dramatically. And uh, just quickly before other questions, Tom, one other thing I think we forgot to put it on here and I'll take the blame for it on the Senate side is the Senate also does have uh, $300 million for public safety aid. It's one-time spending in there. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to touch on that. You might know that a little better than I do. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's a total, it's 300 of direct, well, it's 325 million uh, of aid to cities and counties for uh, essentially officer recruitment, retention, and public safety needs. Uh, obviously, this has been a a key priority of everybody's uh, kind of campaign rhetoric and as a way to help local law enforcement who are, you know, much like other industries are dealing with massive workforce shortages and, and uh, kind of a cliff uh, from a workforce standpoint. That aid goes to the cities and the counties and then they work with their local law enforcement to best see how that, that money would go out. It's distributed on a population basis. That's why it's in the tax bill and not the public safety bill. It's uh, you know it's more of a Department of Revenue uh, item. It's a key priority for the governor as well. Um, and and yeah, we should have probably highlighted that. But it's it's a, certainly a thing that law enforcement supports, and I think is a, a good thing that's probably going to get done this session. And and that was only on the Senate bill, not on the House bill. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And and the governor has a position as well. And I should have said too at the start. 
you know, the reason we didn't include the governor's provisions here is he, when he released his budget, his budget was not confined to the budget targets that they set out. So some some of the spending that he's doing or or position is kind of I don't want to say irrelevant, but it is under different parameters, uh, and so it's hard to kind of compare apples to apples in in the budgeting process between the three. Um, but just so we we have it, I, we we kind of I think we borrowed this from the chamber, Roz, this chart, um, and uh, this kind of shows the different provisions in the you know the senate the house and the governor's bill in terms of where they prioritize their money um it has what their tax increases are what their tax decreases are um and then you really see kind of where the tax increases are in this in the bottom half of the of the presentation here right so the fifth tier here's how much it raises in the house in the first biennium in the second biennium capital gains tax remember was in the governor's bill um, and so that's that's uh, that position, the worldwide reporting, what that raises, uh, and then the federal conformity, um, which is in the out years. And I think that's important to, to just keep in mind based on these are the items from a revenue raiser that are in play in conference committee. Um, the, the unfortunate part is that they've clearly identified that they need to raise somewhere between 1.2 and $2 billion from a, from a new revenue standpoint uh, in order to not go into massive deficits right away. Um, I still think they are gonna go into a deficit right away. I think it's technically inevitable uh, the way that they're budgeting. Um, you know, if I'm wrong, somebody can make me buy them a drink, uh, but it, it just seems like they're, uh, you know, it, it, it seems like simple math to me, but, it, you know, it, I also understand if you are going to spend that way, you clearly have to raise revenue to do it uh, under our constitution of balancing the budget. Um, the unfortunate part is that they think that that's necessary given the status of our state budget and the historic surplus. Hey, Tom, you so said I know Rob is going to agree. Oh, um, go ahead, Mark. You said that fifth tier, the fifth tier uh, includes pass through entities as well, you said? Correct. That's and then correct, does that take away the pass through entity? Deduction that was kind of put into place is at the federal level, right? I think that's at the federal level, and I don't think we don't obviously touch that. So yeah, um, okay. I don't I don't know how that would necessarily interact with with each other, but yeah, they they're increasing that. Um, you know, it's a you know it's a, essentially a two percent increase, right, for for some individuals, but they're also lowering the levels uh, slightly for the 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 fourth and third tiers to raise a little bit more revenue the fifth is getting the most attention um, but it's raising a significant amount of, of revenue as you can see there on the chart um, and I, I was going to say uh, Roz is going to include this in an, in an update so you'll have this so you can look at it ask us questions and, and see what it what it looks like uh, here when we do our, our next legislative update so um, all right um, and I, maybe I should have stopped there. If there's other tax questions, certainly can come back, um, but happy to answer any. We're gonna kind of transition into um, transportation area. Um, you know, this, and, uh, uh, Dave and Donovan spent a lot more time in this committee so they can give you more of the details of what's going on. Um, but I'll just, again, start with the house bill. Um, remember in our transportation system, we raise a significant amount of our revenue through fees. It's not necessarily dedicated general fund revenue. Uh, or you know general fund dollars that are spent on on uh, transportation. So uh, the fees are are what they are, and they've that's kind of been how we've done things. The House bill contains um, maybe one of the most controversial uh, politically uh, political items of the session that's gotten a significant amount of media attention. You probably read about this as a delivery fee. Uh, that's 75 cents on every delivery from Amazon, Target, grocery stores, Grubhub. Um, we have all kind of laughed around the Capitol. Um, to, would, would an Uber ride count as a delivery because you're delivering me to the uh, to the to wherever I'm going? Um, frankly, the the bill language doesn't specify. So I actually think that Uber would tell you that yes, you're going to pay a delivery fee because I'm delivering a human to a different location. Kind of funny. Um, uh, I can tell you most most of these companies and most people involved, uh, this is based off an idea in Colorado uh, and large corporations 
uh, have been telling folks that it's basically impossible to administer uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so if they can't do it, I don't know how the small business that's trying to, I think of um, <laughs> when I lived in Uptown after college, uh, Zips Liquor was uh, delivering uh, your your beer and whatever you ordered to you via bike or whatever. I don't know how they're going to administer a, a 75 cent fee and remit it. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of an interesting thing. They're trying to prioritize local roads. The message that they give is if you if you're working at home and you sit in your office and you're watching your street, you're seeing three, four, five, uh, you know, delivery trucks go by all the time. It's putting a, a wear and tear on our roads and and it you know, we should raise more revenue from, from this source. It's a unique source that isn't uh, raising the gas tax. Um, it was so controversial that it was originally in the Senate bill. You'll note on the other side of the slide, it is not anymore. It was removed in the tax committee um, and uh, would have been voted out by a pretty significant margin of Democrats, actually. Um, they uh, they have a Metro County sales tax of 0.75%, uh, largely uh, to go for transit. Uh, they're raising the motor vehicle sales tax from uh, 6.5 to 6.85. Uh, registration fee schedule kind of has some some rejiggering, um, and overall raises uh, about 1.5 billion in the first biennium and 2.2 uh, .2, uh, in the out biennium. So a significant amount of investment in transit and transportation. Um, I think many would actually say that it's needed. Uh, you know, certainly it spurs development. It's something that we've not necessarily weighed in on as an association, but we have monitored in the past. Um, hey, Tom. In the Senate bill, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Sorry, I was just gonna say, do you know offhand if any of these categories specifically are going toward the Southwest Light Rail, the Ocasio runs, or is that just gonna be somewhere I don't know how they're funding that. Um, yeah, Dave or Don, I, I know that the Met Council had kind of sort of that, I don't know how they're paying for the overruns, but Dave? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it's an open question. Uh, you know, and maybe before I answer that, just on Tom's point on the sales tax and the differences in the bill, uh, you know, uh, with the sales tax, uh, it, that is dedicated to transit uh, originally. And, and both bills started out at 0.75%, uh, as well as the delivery fee. And, and basically the Senate has a closer margin and after a caucus where people uh, balked at raising even more taxes, uh, they, they tried to pare it back. And that's what shows you some of the differences there. The other debate that's going on is, is on the sale, sale metro-wide sales tax for transit. Um, uh, the idea was originally that the Met Council would administer it, and and you know the issue is the five collar counties, uh, you know, pay the tax as well. They have transportation needs, largely roads, not as much transit, uh, and all the money would be spent primarily in in Hennepin and Ramsey County. So there's ongoing discussions about. Uh, expanding the uses of the tax, uh, and I, that'll continue through conference so that it can be used for roads to have some apportionment for those collar counties, and then a discussion about whether the Met Council or some other entity makes decisions on projects, whether transit uh, or or roads. In that context, Southwest Lot Right Light Rails come up because originally those bills have language about not covering cost overruns. Uh, but at this point, Southwest is part of the discussion, uh, uh, whether it be limited to operation or whatever. So it's unresolved. Uh, but the initial, the initial piece of that was not to have it uh, apply. Uh, and that's as everybody can guess with the, the large overruns, that's, uh, that's a pretty contentious issue. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if that that helps, but that's that's yeah, the update. And maybe I'll just really yeah. piggyback on that real quickly, just to your point, Mark. Uh, on the on the on the, the Metro County sales tax, the House does have a pro, a prohibition on using the funds for Southwest, if I recall correctly. I think it's for two years. So, but in the Senate does not. So they do have something in place there. Whether it comes out of conference, I don't know. And just want to flag, I made one mistake on here. It raised the motor vehicle sales tax goes to 6.875, uh, 
and that's in both bills. That would be my fault from one of the late nights that Roz is mentioning. So I just want to clear the record. So it's even higher. Well, <laughs> everybody, this is like an episode of Oprah. Everybody gets a car. Um, <laughs> Uh, and wasn't there uh, some sorry. talk about them moving the motor vehicle sales tax and then taking that away? Did that die? I hope. They they have in both bills uh, more uh, shifting. It's a different schedule or timeline of the sales tax on auto parts, and that is which goes to the general fund. They and Dave or Tom, correct me. I think it was 2017. They shifted a dollar amount of that and it was like 300,000 grew to 370, 375 or something or a million, sorry, not thousand. And then now they're switching it over to a percentage and it's slowly going to grow to a hundred percent to be dedicated to transportation. I think that's maybe what you're referencing, Roz. Yeah, but they haven't, that's they're right. not changing. There's not, no proposal right now that's going to change that back to the general fund, right? Great. No. Thank you. Yeah, um, so we kind of talked about the Senate bill. There's not, uh, I don't think it's just, uh, it's obviously based on the changes Dave highlighted, it raises less revenue. Um, and so that'll be the overall question. You know, uh, cha the chairman of the uh, Senate committee, Scott Dibble from Minneapolis, kind of alluded to the fact that he, his way of thinking about this is we have an $8 billion need for tra transit and transportation in our state. And he's trying to raise at least half of that. And I, I think that's, you know, that's his uh, lens and his perspective. Um, but I want you to, sh to understand that in terms of what he's trying to convince the public and, you know, members of his caucus about. Uh, I don't necessarily uh, share uh, what he defines as a direct need. Um, but I think it kind of gives you the sense of why there's so much of a revenue increase here. His preference uh, in full disclosure would be to raise the gas tax. Uh, and that politically is, is maybe one of the most volatile things that's, uh, you know, it's just not possible. And, and Dave was around uh, in the legislature for that, um, could, could comment on that. But I, I know that's kind of his outward message about it. So I wanted to share that with, with the members today. Yeah, and he actually wanted a larger, I mean, at early in session, you know, we were hearing up to a percent, you know, and then the, and the one thing I would point out that this group, I think, would, have, would appreciate is, you know, there's been pushback, you know, from Republicans and others who are questioning why at a time that there are changing work patterns and, you know, the challenges of occupancy in downtown Minneapolis, well, you know. Should we do some needs analysis of what really the new transit needs are in the metropolitan area before we just go, you know, tax people based on, you know, frankly, pre-COVID transportation needs? Uh, yeah. You know, uh, that hasn't gotten very far, but it seems to be a very reasonable point, right? So, anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. All right. Um, these are. This is kind of a list. I don't know that I'm going to leave all, uh, read all of them, uh, but these are kind of other bills that are impacting uh, NIOP. Uh, none of these uh, right now are uh, are have passed into law. They are in play. They are either in an omnibus bill or moving a standalone uh, bill. Uh, I'll just tick off a couple of them. Uh, We've, we've made significant progress on these first two in, in watering them down to a point where they're not uh, as impactful as they previously were when introduced. Uh, paid family medical leave, you've probably read a lot about that in the, in the paper. It's getting a significant amount of attention, and as it should, it, it um, is going to totally uh, change how companies provide benefits uh, to their employees across the state, and frankly, uh, will likely force all companies to utilize the state system uh, for administering your paid family or paid medical leave benefits. Um, the bills have been changing dramatically at the last hour because key Democrats have said that the bill does not do enough to listen to the business community's concerns. Uh, and so we have seen some attempts to, to change that in both bodies. So I don't want to necessarily focus on what the 
details of it are, but just to say that um, thinking through that, I know there's there's more information I can get you offline. Um, it's very wonky in terms of how this operates, uh, but it's it's going to be a significant impact to uh, businesses and I mean primarily to employees. Some some employees who don't have leave certainly are going to benefit from getting access to paid family medical leave, um, but many benefit sets are going to change uh, accordingly, and and that is a problem for for a lot of people. Um, uh, we are looking as though we are going to legalize cannabis. I know at the start of the year, that would seem like uh, maybe something that wasn't going to happen. Um, I will say that that's my pick. Uh, if I was a betting person for a bill that doesn't make it out of conference committee this year, though, uh, there's significant differences in the House and the Senate bill. Um, I could be wrong on that, but uh, the House bill, or the, I'm sorry, the Senate bill allows for Think about your your liquor liquor stores in the city you live in or the city you, you visit to to you know buy your buy your alcohol. Those cities have uh, licensing capabilities. They have the ability to cap the number of uh, licenses that are authorized, et cetera, uh, and they can they can levy a tax uh, accordingly. The Senate for cannabis allows for uh, a certain portion of the gross receipts tax to be sent to the cities and counties for uh, you know, different needs, whether it be public safety needs in response to this, uh, compliance checks, regular, you know, regulatory needs, et cetera. The House does not have anything a court, uh, like that. They make uh, individuals pay a $200 licensing fee to their local municipality, which uh, don't really think that goes a long way to helping uh, <laughs> public safety or uh, public official needs in response to uh, legal, legalization of cannabis. Um, another great news, uh, we have successfully killed the street impact fee bill this year, uh, which seems to be uh, maybe Roz's uh, claim to fame for the year that she's going to be super happy about. I think that is the 22nd year running of killing them, one of the worst ideas ever to, to come about at the Capitol. For some reason, it it's like the zombie apocalypse that just keeps coming back. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't know if I'm going to retire before uh, that bill goes away. I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, there's some other labor mandates. Uh, I just want to highlight this. Uh, there's uh, in the omnibus housing bill um, and there's been getting a lot of attention, I think certainly in the, in the, in the commercial real estate industry as well about, how do we retrofit or change some office buildings into uh, housing uh, properties? It's been getting some media attention uh, even this week. Um, there's a metro area sales tax in the house bill that's directly dedicated for housing. Um, and so that's not in the Senate bill. It's certainly a different idea. Um, it's something that, uh, you know, it, it would prioritize obviously affordable housing or low income housing uh, over anything else, but it would be a massive investment um, into uh, the development of housing. And so how that shakes out uh, would be interesting to, to see, um, but obviously we're, we'd all be paying for it um, much like we do for transportation or, or transit. So I wanna flag that for you. We'll keep you posted to what happens there. Um, originally, the bill author had the idea that he wanted to increase the state general levy tax to pay for housing, uh, which fortunately he quickly ran away from. Uh, so uh, we've been talking with him about that privately, about how bad of an idea that is. But um, just as an FYI, I thought we should flag that. Um, lastly, hey, sorry. I'll just... Oh yeah, go ahead, Mark. Did you uh, on that back to the paid family leave, medical leave? I mean, we got friends, and I'm sure everybody does with smaller businesses. Yeah, uh, are there any exclusions for smaller businesses because they they're basically feeling they can't afford to stay, you know, to be able to accommodate that and still stay in business and have to deal with you know having somebody else to hire in the meantime while that person's out and you know fill their their role. Is there any talk about small businesses being excluded? Yeah. Um... And I think this is an interesting debate, like what is the definition of a small business, right? Um, the House in the, the tax committee actually added an amendment, which, you know, I would have expected this to happen in the Senate first and foremost, but added it in the House that 
the individuals would still get the leave of employees of businesses that are 30 and, and fewer. But the business right now, the way that the program's set up is it, it's primarily a split or it can't, it can't be more than a 50, 50 split between employer and employee contributions for the program. Mm -hmm. The employer section of that payment for 30 and fewer is state covered now in the house bill. So there's no cost to the, to the employer for 30 and fewer, which is obviously a large give but everybody else who's in the program, your premiums are going to go up to pay for that coverage, right? Um, and so um, it doesn't exempt them from having leave, uh, but it exempts them from the financial burden of paying for that leave, which uh, is, a, is a big step. Yeah. Um, I will say part of this, uh, part of the floor debate in the house was very interesting. The chief author was asked, do you have to be employed to take leave? Which you would think is a kind of a silly question, but the reality is no, you do not have to be currently employed to pay leave because the way it, um, the way it works is actually based on an accrual of the leave. So you could, let's say you were a seasonal employee or you were uh, somebody that, you know, kind of changes jobs on a frequent level, uh, you paid into the system you had met the requirements of being employed for the first however long they set that bar at you can take the leave and, and get paid accordingly and could function similar to a unemployment insurance that is very very different because the state's paying that benefit back out to you um, kind of a similar kind of weird part of that in relation to the to the employee uh, definition so um, that's not necessarily the same in the senate bill there's a significant amount of differences as Dave and, and I and Donovan have alluded to, the Senate being 34-33 uh, split really empowers any member to to make a um, make a change at the last minute, saying I'm demanding I need this to to order for uh, in order for me to vote for the bill. Um, so we're still kind of waiting to see how that happens. It has not passed off the Senate floor yet, and that has um, been quite entertaining to watch what happens on on the floor because amendments have gone on that i don't think we would have uh you know certainly would not go on in the house where they have a larger gap uh in partisanship one other quick question too i was at a conference last week around data centers and there was a woman from excel energy who's been in a couple of conferences um talking about the availability of power here is is good uh, comparatively to other states, and so it's, they're trying to attract more businesses to put data centers of different sizes. Um, however, they and they say that we're cutting edge as far as green energy amongst other states. Um, but they said that I asked about the cost of the power because uh, Chicago's power, you know, Illinois and Chicago area is lower than ours, and that's mainly due to our regulations and our taxes. Do we have any? pressure on taking down any of those costs of bringing power? Because I mean, you've got on one hand demand and, and capacity, on the other hand, you've got costs that are dis, you know, at a disadvantage. Yeah, I don't, I think the answer to that question, Mark, is no. Um, I don't think we're making energy more affordable in our, in our legislative process here. Um, and maybe that's a good transition to the next slide actually, um, because we did pass, um, being referred to as the 2040 bill, so we set clean energy standards by which um, you know businesses uh, you know have to meet or, or energy has to meet uh, you know by 2040. If you'll remember, Excel has come out publicly and said that their goal is 2050 to achieve basically carbon neutral or carbon free uh, you know energy sources, um, and the legislature is is basically demanding that that happen 10 years earlier. Um, they do have off ramps in there. There are different nuances to that where things can be, um, you know, not carbon neutral or, or what have you, depending on the score of the energy. But that to your point, Mark, is not gonna make energy any cheaper in the, in the short term, right? I know the, the MISO grid that we're all on has been stretched and, and been strained to the point that, um, you know, over the summer, they were 
warning people of potential blackouts uh, in the Midwest, which, uh, you know, has not, I don't know of a time that that's happened uh, in my lifetime. I don't, I'd be happy to learn of a different time in, in Minnesota where we've had that. Um, and so I think we're going to see some more push and pull on that. And it's not, it's not in the best uh, situation from a cost standpoint for rate payers. Yeah, I, I definitely see that. I mean, as they all talk about it, demands for EVs and whatnot and having to be able to supply the additional grid for that, it's going to be tough to be able to supply everything. She also said that transformers right now are almost a five-year wait, and those are mostly coming from overseas. So there's a lot of bottlenecks to yeah. you know, to provide additional growth for the MISO. Yeah, there's been a massive interconnection problem for new projects and new development uh, for solar you know, solar guilds and everything. I mean, you know, it's such a, a, a regulatory mess. I don't, you know, I don't, <laughs> I'm glad I don't understand every detail of it because I think my head would fall off uh, from Spain so much, but it, it does seem like we're not, we, we clearly have identified a goal as a country and as a state of where we're going to head, but the details of how we get there really seem to be problematic and, and, um, not on the same page so that that is in here these are bills uh, that i've listed uh that have already passed into law um, some of them i've just colloquially kind of included what they're referred to as um so like the crown act for example is uh, a bill that uh, you can't discriminate based on uh hairstyles uh which is uh you know very important to african-american community and, and one of the, the chief authors uh, of the in the house, um, I'll just uh, you know I, I will just say you know this is pretty historic stuff in the sense that obviously unified control allows them the ability to to pass standalone bills. Some of them are high profile. Some of them are you know kind of less uh, you know sexy bills. Uh, but the reality is they you know they they certainly are things that. You know, like funding for the attorney general to to prosecute enhanced criminal cases. That's something that the attorney general's office, not only under uh, Keith Ellison, but previous uh, office holders has been pushing for for years. So getting that done and accounted for, um, you know, food shelf program funding, you know, those things are are things that shouldn't be controversial and and aren't. Um, but they in the past have ended up in uh, omnibus bills and now are able to be passed uh, as standalone uh, legislation. Um, but it does include several high profile social issues, as you'll see, um, you know, I think we covered this in our post election recap. Um, you know, we had, uh, you know, significant legislation is passing in, in relation to uh, protecting the right to an abortion in our state uh, that had previously been covered by case law, but now is codified in state law. Um, you know, there's also uh, a significant amount of attention paid for, paid to, um, you know, protecting the rights of transgender individuals uh, that has, has drawn the attention of national media. Um, but then I'll just focus too on, um, you know, restoring the right to vote for uh, some past felons was a big high profile issue. Driver's license for all was a big high profile issue that's been around for a long time. Um, we we are also finally enhancing penalties for catalytic converter theft and catalytic converter possession. So if you have any catalytic converters in your car uh, right now uh, and you get pulled over, you're going to go to jail. Uh, so please uh, sell those as quickly as you can. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's uh, I, I, in all seriousness, it was such a controversy. I can't believe that it took this long to get it done. Um, and for anybody who has a friend or a family member that's gone through that, uh, they know how ridiculous that uh, process has been. Um, and then the other, the other one I want to focus on that it did not get attention, uh, but and I know Donovan knows a lot about this, is the un unwinding of the public health emergency. And a lot of this has to do with the federal dollars that flowed into our state in, in relation to COVID and, and how individuals who received those benefits um, will now go back onto state systems and unwind from different systems. And it has been quite controversial and it could have a significant impact going forward for uh, a variety of different Minnesotans. And I think um, 
I'll just say candidly, our state's uh, IT infrastructure and uh, disasters around Minsher and how poorly that rollout has gone. I'm not feeling very comfortable with where this is going to lead us to, and I think there's going to be a lot of attention given to to how uh, individuals that need the most care uh, and the most public support from a public health standpoint are taken care of uh, in terms of transitioning back onto a, a different system. And I think we're going to read a lot of stories about that in in you know post session, and they're not going to be fun. And it's going to be an individual who moved or uh, you know, didn't um, didn't enroll in the appropriate time, and so they lost their benefits that helped them stay alive from X, Y, or Z disease, and it's going to be um, harrowing stuff. And so, I uh, luckily they passed it early as they could. They probably could have passed it a lot earlier, but um, you know, something that isn't really talked about in the media, but is going to have a significant impact. Um, but I, I just leave this up here, happy to answer any questions. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, just one, maybe one technical thing I'll add is the bills in here that have financial impact are already accounted for in the budget. So they, that's already kind of spent and taken care of and kind of taken off the, the top line, if you will. So just add that too. Do we have any questions? There's a lot of stuff that's been happening, that's for sure. <laughs> now, Sean, your and, hands up. Yeah, hey. Uh, taking turns on my own committee here. Um, <laughs> I Just out of curiosity, um, there's been talk in D.C. about uh, what the, um, uh, the requirements for back to work is. Are, could you maybe share like our our state workers, county workers, are they being forced to go back into the office or do you guys know about that at all? Just out of curiosity. Um, well, there's no legislation impacting that issue. I can tell you that much. I know that um, it varies by state agency. Um, I think uh, it's safe to say uh, the state is uh, kind of operating in a similar fashion to many corporations where predominantly people are working from home um, as or having flexibility. Uh, I think, uh, you know, certainly the governor's office and those that are external partners or what have you are not. Um, but I think uh, it's safe to say there's more people working from home or working remotely than uh, you would think and frankly obviously prior to covid that was never an opportunity you know that was never an option right state workers did not uh necessarily have that um flexibility so i don't know if that answers your question sean not really <laughs> but i just curious if you just had a general sense of of you know as you my, go in the office but it's I'm, yeah. My general sense is is about 95% of them are working from home. Um, I'm trying to be as nice about it as possible. Um, you know, the, <laughs> the biggest example, is, frankly, and I don't think given the agency, it will surprise anybody, but um, the Department of Health and, and the Department of Human Services buildings are some of the nicest state buildings that we have. Uh, they're right off the highway in 94. They got great glass walls, great buildings. I would like to work in that building. There ain't a single person in that damn building um, to speak candidly. Um, there's uh, talking to friends over there. There's no pressure to come back. Um, there's, uh, you know, they're just, it's just a different era. And I think they can't, incur there's not an incentive to get them to come back either because they're, um, you know, you're, you're dealing with a state contract. You're dealing with a variety of different impact, you know, impacts and they aren't, able to necessarily do things that maybe a company could uh, from a carrot and stick standpoint that, uh, you know, are, are dictated by uh, state contracts. That helps, Sean. Is that more candid for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I just think Donovan kind of mentioned this too, but it's like, or no, not not Donovan, but uh, um, Dave, I one of the other questions I had was was around public transit and, and are they 
starting to talk about, you know, how to redo this. I mean, with all these new patterns and using themselves as an example. I mean, if they're, if 95% of their workforce is staying home, who the hell is telling these guys that we still have to build trains out to, you know, this hub and spoke system. Um, and how do we do, how do we better yeah. do this? I guess, you know, even with buses and everything else, it's like, how do we, how do we better accommodate this? So. Yeah, I think, um, that's going to be an ongoing conversation. Uh, you know, I don't disagree with you. I would say that you'd be underwhelmed by the amount of discussion about it. I mean, Dave's right that some people are are pointing that out. I think they're generally Republicans. Um, and, uh, you know, Scott Dibble, for example, is still using the fact that downtown companies, uh, you know, want to attract millennials who want to ride on, you know, light rail to work. And it's, so like, well, actually, millennials want to work from their home office and, you know, work they want to go to work. 10 hours, four or 10 hour shift. Right. Um, yeah, right. Um, you know, and uh, and so I kind of, you know, I think that we're not at the, like all things in government, they're usually some years behind uh, in the conversation. Um, and I don't think they've recognized that that is a, a massive transformation. Uh, in the workforce. Is that 10 hours a week there, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mark, as a, as a, uh, as a begrudging millennial, I can tell you I work more than 10 hours a day. So I don't know who the hell these people are or where they, you know, think they're going to work in the future. But, uh, yeah, it's, um, I hate to be, I hate to admit I'm a millennial on the call. It's not, not a fun deal. Um, <laughs> Uh, other questions, thoughts, comments? Um, the historic tax credit is that's a yeah. that's a just a negotiating strategy, right? They're both in favor. Mm, yeah, I think or, I think no? um, it's a it's a definitely a strategy. I will say that the house the house committee I think is in favor of the historic tax credit. The house chair is very much opposed to the idea. She okay. is. Um, you know, she, I don't know, Donovan, how I would characterize her opinion of it. I think she thinks it's a way to hand out free money, frankly, um, that should be prioritizing other items. Um, I don't think she understands that there's some real value through the supply chain here for these buildings. Um, and, uh, but I don't know, Donovan, what, what am I missing in terms of how she, how would she characterize her comments? I think you said it pretty well i think this is just kind of her general philosophy on taxes in a little bit and she thinks kind of along the lines that only certain areas or neighborhoods or cities will take it will take advantage of this leaving other other areas that can't afford to do this you know in different way and it kind of goes to her op like like in the Senate tax bill, Senator Rest included just about every local sales tax that was proposed to the Senate and House. And the, the chair in the House opposed them on the same idea, like, well, we can fix up, um, no offense to any cities here, but we can fix up Minnetonka because they're more willing to pass it. But, but North Minneapolis, won't pass it and they get left behind so she'd rather keep the kind of money which it isn't state money that's going out it's all local money but she thinks like by doing that it's just setting up different pockets along this around the state so the same sort of idea with the historic tax credits like you can go in and fix up rochester you'll go fix up rochester but and i hope no one's from erskine minnesota but you're not going to go put a nice you know fix up an old building there and not that it's not a nice town but that's kind of her general philosophy which is like I think just to kind of wrap up here like Tom Dave and I are all looking forward to the tax conference committee for how opposite the chair's views are and it could be kind of fireworks in May so yeah I would yeah. I would rank uh rank the most you know popcorn worthy for those of us who are sickos over here uh uh, as taxes would be the number one committee to watch the two chairs basically mm -hmm. passive aggressively fight with one another and tell tell each other how uh, how wrong they are 
about their version of tax policy. It's going to be, uh, it's sad that I think that's entertaining actually. I, probably a comment on us than it is about on them. So, so in summary, are there and then, any, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, in the commercial real estate tax side of things or fees for development from the cities or state, are there any real reductions right now planned in anybody's proposals? No, unfortunately not. Um, no. You know, I, th I think my version of the reduction, Mark, is, uh, is that there's not massive increases. There's massive increases right. on the, the op operation of your business uh, and the operations of uh, your tenants' businesses, um, but not on the actual property or uh, the development. Well, I mean, it depends on how you look at it. I mean, there is a 40% increase in spending, so they got to come up with the money from somewhere. And so I think it, it's sort of dabbled everywhere. It's whether it's increase in your car car tabs or or um, I mean, I'm I'm concerned about the capital gains tax. That's that could be yeah. low hanging fruit in the negotiation, and that will certainly come out of the transaction because almost every commercial building is owned in some LLC or some other thing like that. No, get thrown into that top tier tax rate, or uh, potentially increase the capital gains tax. It's going to come out of the transaction. So to me. Those are some of the ones that I'm following along with the three and a half billion dollar in transportation taxes that's gonna affect us or metro wide sales tax. I mean, it's we're all gonna pay for this in some form or another. And the other thing on the medical paid leave, whatever, um, I think they have in the target is about half of what it's actually gonna cost. So, and there's no parameters on how much that tax is gonna be. So that that is another, whether it's a payroll tax, whether you're an employee or an employer, that's that's gonna affect you too. So I think I think it's gonna come in a variety of different forms and um, your taxes are going up. It's the bottom line. Some in some form, whether it's property taxes or income taxes or fees or other additional fees that they've come up with. And um, but these programs cost money. Amazing. I mean, when they should be focusing on how many people and businesses are leaving the state, this is just driving it further. Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, to, to, your, to that uh, end, uh, uh, well, just we one, are getting one, our time. I was just going to say, you know, four other states, these paid family leave programs are insolvent, and we're an outlier on the benefits on almost every single one of them. Tom and Donovan and I, you know, the debate is trying to get them closer uh, to other states. Uh, because of, of the benefit side of it, so. Well, thanks everyone. Yeah, have a, uh, kind of a, yeah. Yeah. Have a good day. <laughs> well, just, just let me um, say here, uh, I think at the beginning, Steph mentioned we're targeting June 6 for our happy hour. We've, we've, we've done this virtual all year and it works really well, but I think uh, it's time to get together and uh, share a cocktail or apps, Diet Coke, whatever your preference is. Also, um, you know, Roz mentioned that, you know, all these things cost money. So for us to make a difference on this, uh, that also costs some money and we do have a pack. And so along with that e email uh, that we'll be sending out, really want you all to consider contributing to our pack, whether it's a hundred dollars, 50, whatever, all that helps. Um, I think part of the, uh, what we can explain too is you know, we don't need to raise oodles and oodles of money to make a difference at the state level. So any one of your contributions is really going to help. And um, last year, I was proud to make uh, on behalf of this committee, um, some checks. And I think uh, Senator Rust was was has been very um, supportive of us and uh, hears us out. And I think, um, um, you know, I'm not going to say it's the direct result of us of a of a I think we was it like a $300 check to her but uh, uh, you know the state general levy is not on the menu this year and um, I think all the efforts that we've done the past five years have really added up to that and so continuing with our um, pack we, we, we want to continue with that program so please consider giving please consider showing up on the sixth event and um, Roz I'm going to give it to you for your last thought. Well, thanks for being here today. 
We have a lot of information, but guess what? It's still a moving target. So we'll uh, be keeping you guys uh, in tune of what's happening, but really at the June 6th, we'll know much, much more of really what has passed and how we're going to adjust. <laughs> anyway, thanks for being here today. And Sean, thanks for that nice plug at the end. And Tom and Donovan and Dave, we really appreciate your input and your work that you do. We couldn't do it without you. And from that, well, I think we'll sign off. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Have a great day. Take care. You too.